I just got the recorder started and obviously this is the wrong screen to show. This is what I do when I write scripts, you know, I have like a bazillion you know, tabs open. But you know that already. All right, so let me get to the homework assignment that's due today. And we'll start with that. All right, this is 440. And our relation homework assignment is right here. All right, there we go. <clears throat> All right, so we are going to talk about this. Um, consider the not equal to relation over all integers. Which of the following relation properties apply? So we'll go over the easy ones first, and then we'll go over the more difficult ones. The first one is reflexive. Definitely not reflexive, right? Because a value is not, not equal to itself. So we can rule out reflexive, which means you know, we can rule out totally ordering and also partially ordering as well because reflexive is needed for those two. The next one is symmetric. It is symmetric because if A does not equal to B, then B does not equal to A. So it is symmetric. Um, Anti-symmetric is eh, a little bit harder. We'll get to it later. Let's look at transitive, okay? So transitive requires three things, right? But there's no one saying that those three things have to be all different. So that means E can be one, F can be two, and then G can be one again. So one does not equal to two, and two does not equal to one. But that's, does that mean one does not equal to one? No. So it is not transitive, okay? So it is not transitive. So we only got one left to do, which is anti-symmetric. So what does anti-symmetric mean? If A relates to B and B relates to A, then A and B have to be the same. So in this case, A does not equal to B. Yep. Okay, so A does not, I mean, one does not equal to B. Uh, one does not equal to two. And two does not equal to one. And does one and two, are they the same? No. So it fails that you know, implication. So that means it is not anti-symmetric. In this case, not equal to is just symmetric. Or at least that's what I think, okay? I, I cannot remember the answers, okay? You know, this is just me working on these problems on the fly. Okay, question number two, equal to. All right, so equal to is symmetric because if one equals to one, then one equals to one. Okay, that sounds pretty symmetric to me. Um, one equals to one, B, two equals to two. Okay, that, that's definitely reflexive. It is also anti-symmetric because if one equals to one and one equals to one, then one equals to one, that seems true to me. Anti-symmetric. So um, is it partially ordered? Yes. Is it transitive? Yes, because one equals one, and one equals one implies one equals one, okay? So that means it is transitive, but it is not totally ordered. It is partially ordered, not totally ordered, because it is not comparable. Meaning that if, I give, if you give me any two integers, they are not related, necessarily related by equal to as a relation. That's why it is not totally ordered. So it's everything but totally ordered. It is partially ordered, oddly. Are we good so far? Yep. Why is it anti-symmetric? Anti okay, so I'm gonna ask you back, what is anti-symmetric? You have to be a little bit more specific. No. Try a little harder. What is the definition? You can read off the definition from the module. 
So I was hoping that after this homework assignment, you guys would know the definitions by heart. Okay, you don't have to use the math symbols, you know, because I just mentioned it a little bit earlier. If E relates to F and F relates to E, then E and F are the same. That's the best I can put it in natural language. So in this case, why would it not be anti-symmetric? Can you find me a case where E relates to F or E equals F and F equals E and yet E and F are not the same? Find me a single instance like that, then I can say, nope, it is not anti-symmetric. If you fail to find a single instance like that, then it is by default anti-symmetric. So it all boils down to the definitions. You really have to get down to the definitions and truly understand the quantification side of the expressions. All right, question number three. <clears throat> R and S are both relations defined over X, meaning that R and S are both subsets of the Cartesian product of X, o, uh, uh, X and itself. And we know that the intersection between these two relations is reflexive. Then what do we know for sure about R? Well, the only thing we know is it is reflexive. We don't know anything else. We just know that it has to be reflexive. Because reflexive is the only property of a relation that relies on just certain members being in the relation. So if you have these specific you know, uh, two tuples in the relation, then it qualifies as reflexive. You can have more, you, can, you cannot have less, but you can have more. And the property of the additional elements in the relation would not impact its property of being reflexive. All of the other ones are not as easy as reflexive because they all have to do with you know, um, how tuples relate to each other. So that's number three. Number four, don't you hate these ones? You know, with all the different boxes, it's like, but you don't tell me how many of the boxes are applicable. Sometimes it's just one, and sometimes it's all except for one, and sometimes it's like, yeah, I like questions like that because it really have to, it really make you think. It makes you think. Consider the less than relation over integers. Which of the following relation properties apply? Well, let's rule out some ones you know, that we know for sure is easy to rule out. It is definitely not reflexive because a value is not less than itself, cannot be. Okay, so we rule that out, which means we automatically also rule out totally ordered and also partially ordered. Okay, so those two are out for sure. So now we just have a few more to consider. Is it symmetric? One is less than two. Does that imply... Is one less than two if and only if two is less than one? No. Okay, so it's not uh, symmetric. Is it anti-symmetric? Well, that's the really odd one because we cannot find anything. You, know, we can, you cannot give me two integers, let's say A and B, where A is less than B and B is less than A. So the conjunction is guaranteed to be false in the implication. What happens when the when the left-hand side of a implication is guaranteed false. What happens? The implication itself is guaranteed true. So very oddly, this one is actually anti-symmetric. Are we doing okay so far with this? Okay. Um, and then we only have transitive left. It is transitive because if A is less than B and B is less than C, then A is less than C. That sounds pretty intuitive for integers. All right, so do we have any questions about number four? So once again, it really boils down to the definitions of the properties. I would not even go by the names, okay? You know, symmetric is just a word to me. It's just an ID to me. I would drill down to the actual definition in order to evaluate each and every single one of these relations. Um, question number five, consider the greater than or equal to relation over integers, which of the following properties apply? Um, actually, in this case, it's all of the above, every single one. Okay, so let's start with transitive. If A is greater than 
or equal to B and B is greater than or equal to C, does that imply A is greater than or equal to C? Okay, for integer, that seems pretty obvious. Uh, re reflexive, is a particular integer value greater than or equal to itself? The key is or equal to, okay? Every integer equals to itself, so it is reflexive. It, is it symmetric? Ah, okay, we are missing symmetric. It is not symmetric. Okay, I correct myself. I lied. Earlier I said it's every single one. No, it is not symmetric. Because A is less than or equal to B does not guarantee that B is less than or equal to A. Can it be? Yes, A and B can be the same, but it does not guarantee that, you know, one, um, if A relates to B, it does not guarantee that B relates to A in less, greater than or equal to. Um, we'll get to anti-symmetric because I cannot answer partially ordering or totally ordering without knowing whether it is anti-symmetric or not. So I'm once again, I'm looking for, if I give you uh, E is greater than or equal to F and F is greater than or equal to E, does that imply E and F are the same? Yes, okay. So it is anti-symmetric. So if it is anti-symmetric, it is transitive and it is reflexive, then it is partially ordered. So we only have to think about the, if you give me any two integers, do they relate based on greater than or equal to? One way or the other, okay? I don't have to go in both directions. Just one direction is good enough. Yep, so it is also totally ordered, okay? Now I'm suspecting that you know, chat GPT can probably answer most of these questions correctly. I'm not sure who tried it. <laughs> I would give it a try just for curiosity, like after the test, after the homework is done, I'm just, just gonna go back and, and try that out. In fact, let's go ahead and do it now because I, I just want to test the ability of you know, chat and GPT, which is just you know, 3.5, it's nothing fancy. All right, so we'll ask is uh, greater than or equal to, which one do you think is the trickiest one to figure out? Anti-symmetric? Okay, anti-symmetric. Yes, <laughs> it is anti-symmetric. Um, let me see what the explanation is. A relation R on a set is considered anti-symmetric if for all distinct elements A and B on the set, whenever A and B and B, when A, B and B, A are both in R, then A must be equal to B. Actually, there's no need to say distinct elements in this case, because if A and B are not distinct, it's still okay. Okay, you know, we can still use this A, B, B, A, B, and B, A to imply A, B are the same. So there's no need for distinct elements in this case. But ChatGPT did come back with the correct answer. So let's ask it the other one, okay? Is greater than or equal to, um, what is the next? Uh, symmetric, it is not symmetric. So let's see whether ChatGPT can answer this one correctly. Aha, that is correct also. So it even gives you a counter example of why it is not symmetric. So not bad, okay? I wouldn't rely on chat and GBT because the homework assignment carries a tiny percentage of your overall score. The next exam is going to include relations and it is not going to be online. So chat and GBT cannot really help you in the exam. So I would do your, I would use ChatGPT for explanation, okay? Give me examples of blah, blah, blah. And I wouldn't even trust it all the way because you know, I know that ChatGPT can make logical mistakes sometimes. And you can gaslight it also. <laughs> you can insist something is even though it is not. And then ChatGPT will eventually go like, oh, I'm sorry, I, I was wrong about that. <clears throat> all right, question number six. If R is a relation defined over X is known to be reflexive, which of the following do we know for sure regardless of the actual definitions of R and X? 
All right, so we got a bunch of stuff here. Uh, we'll answer this one if and only if none of these apply. Um, the cardinality do not equal to each other. We don't know because you know uh, they can be the same, okay? Which means we barely have all the elements in order to be reflexive in the relation, but we don't have anything extra. So in that case, it they equal to. So I cannot check this one. Um, greater than or equal to? Eh, sounds promising. I'm gonna keep an eye on this one. Equal to? Nope. They don't have to be equal to because you know the relation R can contain additional two tuples and still be reflexive once it has all the basic ones. Um, this has to be less than the other one. That does not make sense at all because every element in X has to relate to itself. So that means the cardinality of R has to be at least the cardinality of X. So that leaves me to think that this is the correct answer. All right, moving on to question number seven. If R is a relation defined over X and R is known to be symmetric this time, which of the following do we know for sure regardless of how R and X are defined? All right, so this time we're dealing with symmetric. And with symmetry, um, I hope you remember that the empty set as a relation, the empty relation is symmetric because that's a really cool um, thing to remember. All right, so that will automatically rule this one out, right? Because, you know, X can contain a bunch of elements and R can be empty, which means we have zero on one side and we have a large number on the other side. This cannot be the case. Um, R has to be even. Nope, R does not have to be even because you can have a single element um, and it will still be um, symmetric. They are guaranteed to be different. Nope, they are not guaranteed different. They are the same. Nope, they're not guaranteed the same. One has to be greater than or equal to the other one. Nope, one has to be less than or equal to the other one. Or it has to be odd. Nope. So you have to say none of the other choices can be confirmed. Now with cases like this, um, the best way for you to go about doing this is to think of examples to say that, nope, that cannot be the answer. So you look at every single one and ask yourself, can I come up with an X and an R so that this condition is false. Then you can rule that one out. In the process of you know, in the process of coming up with examples like that, you are exercising. Okay, you know that is basically how quote unquote you study for this class is you think about okay, can I come up with examples such that blah blah blah. And as you go through that exercise, coming up with the example, that is how you study because that's how you think in terms of the qualifications of the properties of a relation and try to think of, hmm, can I make it this way? Can I make it that way? And that's, that really is the way you know, that you, that I think is a good way to study. All right, so I think I got full score for this one. Yep, seven out of seven, so it is all good. Do we have any questions? Okay, so I ran the script this morning. I just finished it right before class. Um, so it should have put a scanned copy of your exam along with the solution of the exam specific to your question set in a folder that is read only to you. So you can give it a check, okay? You know, basically I just created one folder per student as a Dropbox and then I put all the exams according to your exam number, the ID, and put the key or you know, the solution into your folder uh, along with a scanned copy of your exam. If yours is not found, okay, then let me know because you know, I probably have to fix the script in some way or another. All right, yep. Find the uh, shared folder. Um, you can go to, if you just go to your, Okay, first of all, this is going to be in the apps.losreels.edu um, Google Drive, so you have to go there first. And then once you get there, you know, I have a lot more apps than you do probably, uh, that is the case, but you go to Google Drive, and under Google Drive, it should appear as a shared folder or shared with me. 
Yep. So under shared with me, uh, just look for that folder, which should be just your name or your ID, sorry, your ID. So look for your own ID in Google Drive and see if you can find it. If you cannot find it, you know, but you do have to sign in to the Los Rios uh, Google Drive, you know, because that's the only place I have access to share with. So any other questions about Uh, more elements in R than there are elements in X. Okay. Did I mention the empty relation earlier? Okay, so let's go back to the last question because I just want to be sure what it's asking. I thought it's asking about um, symmetry. That's good old sy symmetry, right? The empty relation is symmetric. So you can make X, you know, having elements one, two, and three, and R being an empty set, it is still symmetric. So that means, which one are you looking at? The, the last one, like R is odd, or the cardinality of R is odd? This one? Say that again. The cardinality of R is greater than the cardinality of X. I just gave you an example of how this is false. Okay. Was that re did that register for the whole class? Because it's kind of important. Okay. When I said R is a re empty relation, what do I mean by that? What? There's no element in the relation. That is correct. What is the cardinality of a relation that has no elements in it? Zero. And if I make X you know, having the elements one, two, and three, what is the cardinality of that? Three. So is zero greater than or equal to three? No. So that means we can rule that one out. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions about relations? Nope, okay. All right. So we are continuing with propositional logic. So last time we talked about how everything can be converted into CNF, okay? So CNF stands for conjunctive normal form. So you can throw any Boolean expression at me and I can say, I can convert that into a conjunctive normal form. So does anyone want to give it a try? We can use, um, we can use a resolution itself, okay? Resolution itself you know, is a CNF, can, can be turned into a CNF. So let's go ahead and do that. I am debating how to do this because handwriting is not going to be as quick as typing. So I'm going to use mousepad, just a regular text editor for this purpose. All right, so first thing first, what is resolution? What does it mean when I say resolution? It refers to one particular implication. So can someone tell me what that implication looks like? Or can someone tell me where to find that expression? How about we just search for it? Not chat GPT, it's right here, okay? So it is in the module. It is important to read the module. And the resolution logic is this, okay? This is just a long proof. This expression itself, is resolution, okay? This is what resolution means. So let's go ahead and start with this one and see whether we can turn that into a CNF. Okay, so I'm hiding the rest because I don't need to show anything else. All right, so instead of using the Greek letter, which I cannot type on the keyboard, I'm just gonna use A, B, and C, okay? So we have A or B and uh, not B, 
oops, not, not B or C implies um, A or C. Okay, so converting all the Greek letters into into the uh, English alphabet and also um, converting from the original math notation to the lazy notation that I like to use, that's what we have. So now the question is, what do we need to do to turn this into a CNF? All right, so we'll do the derivation step by step. <clears throat> All right, so the first thing I need to do is to get rid of the implication, okay? Because implication is not difficult to get rid of. Um, we just have to negate the left-hand side. This is the entire left-hand side. Copy and paste, and then or the right-hand side, which is just A or C. Okay, so this is by the definition of implication. All right, so now that we have this, let's see what we can do with this. Okay, I'm, make, I'm missing an extra pair, extra open paren, not the entire pair, just the open. Okay, do we have any questions about this particular step? I just used the definition of implication. A implies B is saying exactly the same thing as not A or B. Are we good with that? Okay, so now I look at this and go like, well, if you see a negation on something, like conjunction or disjunction, let's get rid of that first, okay? In other words, we want to quote unquote distribute negation all the way in to the variables themselves, okay? Because your CNF does not allow negation on anything other than a variable. So that means, you know, um, which, which law should I use in Boolean algebra? Which law does the thing of quote unquote distributing negation to the components inside the negated and or the negated, negated and or negated or? It has a name. De Morgan's law, very good, okay. So De Morgan's law it is, okay. So we now apply De Morgan's law, which means we have the negated version of A or B. And then we have to turn the and, the original and into a or, the negation of B, oh, the negation of B or C. So copy and pasting would work slightly better here. And then we have the rest, which is just A or C. So this is based on D Morgan's law. There we go. All right, looks like we can apply the Morgan's law again, right? Because you know, we have you know, not, uh, this is the negation of an or, this is the negation of another or. So we'll go ahead and apply the Morgan's law again. So this time we have uh, not A and not B. And then this one, we have not not B and not C. We'll do the simplification later. And then we have A or C by themselves. Okay, so this is another ap application of the Morgan's law. The Morgan's law. All right, this is not um, CNF. This is actually DNF. This is disjunctive normal form where you have a disjunction of a bunch of conjunctions. It fits into that form. So now we have to go the opposite way and turn it into a CNF, a conjunctive normal form. Okay, so before we do that, let's do some simplification. So we have not A, not B, or B, not C, or A, or C. All right, so this is just you know, some simplifications. Nothing major. All right, so now what do we do? We have, what is the strategy that you are going to use in order to turn something like this into a CNF? So there are only a few tricks you can pull at this point. We know De Morgan's law cannot be applied anymore because we don't have the negation of a, an operator. Um, I think we can use distribution. Okay, so we can apply distribution. So we can do FOIL, okay? So let's FOIL these two, okay? So I'm gonna put parentheses around these two just so that we can focus on just these two. So what does FOIL look like, okay? Well, what does distribution look like first? 
So distribution in Boolean algebra. Okay, so I'm going to have to say Boolean algebra. Distribution comes in two forms. Um, the form that we are looking at is probably a um, B plus C. Well, this is one form. This is not the one that we're looking for. This is A, B, or A, C. The other one is A, B, A, or B, and C. That turns out to be A, or B, and A, or C. So there are two distribution methods, and this is the first one, which we are sort of familiar with, because this one looks familiar, because this is also what you do with typical algebra. The other one is not typical at all to us, because you know, that does not work with numerical values. But in Boolean algebra, that does work. Is everybody convinced that you know, distribution works in both cases, or do you want me to give you the truth table for the one that does not seem, does not seem right? The second one, okay, all right, so let's do that. All right, so let's do the truth table, A, B, C, then we have A or B, C, B and C, and then we have A or B and A or C, okay. So um, the typical way that I do this is, this can be false or true. This is opposite to my usual spreadsheet method, because the usual spreadsheet method is I alternate um, every other with the first column, and that's just easier to write when I need to um, do it programmatically. This one, you know, the way, the reason why I do it this way, why I alternate the rightmost column, is this is also how we write binary numbers in increasing order. So we have, oh, okay, I just made a mistake. <clears throat> this is supposed to be a zero, one, zero, and another one. Because this is basically how you write 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, you know, in binary. Okay, so it's, it, it looks natural to me to do it this way, but when I do it in the spreadsheet, I kind of flip it to, to the other side because that makes it more scalable. I can add additional um, variables without having to reformat everything. So this is, you know, the reason why I change the way I organize, you know, depending on, you know, how it's done. So this is zero, this is zero, that's an easy one. What about this one? Well, this is gonna be a zero, and that is going to be a zero, okay. What about this one? Uh, same, because B and C are kind of symmetric. Okay, now we got a one, and we got a one over here. And let's see, A itself is true. Okay, these, this, okay. these are easy to do because if one side is true, then the entire thing is gonna be true. So if A is true, then the entire disjunction is gonna be true. But getting on this side, uh, since A is a common component on both of the disjunctions in the conjunction, so whenever A is true, you know, we, we can also guarantee that, that the entire thing is true. So we all have a bunch of ones here. And there we go, okay? So this is the proof that you know, distribution works the odd way to in Boolean algebra. This does not work with when A, B, and C are numbers and you have multiplication and actual addition, but when we have disjunction and conjunction here, it does work out. The truth table basically says, yeah, for all the possible cases, you know, for all the possible values of A, B, and C, the two expressions turn out to be exactly the same. Is that okay? So this is a technique that you can use you know, by yourselves in order when you, whenever you feel that, okay, I'm not sure about the equivalency between these two, that is how, what you can do to say that, yep, I'm now convinced that either they are the same or they are not the same, okay? All right, so getting back to what we need to do. So now we want to apply, um, the, uh, the FOIL based on the second uh, distribution rule. Okay, so how would that work? So I'm gonna do this first. We're gonna end up with four terms. 
okay? Because whenever you do FOIL, you are basically doing a quote-unquote cross product. So we just have to get these things crossed. So not A paired up with B, and then we have not A paired up with not C. Then we have not B paired up with B, and then we have not B paired up with not C. Okay. Is that kind of how you guys do it? You know, when you have to deal with FOIL in algebra. Except this one looks kind of odd because you know in algebra this rule would is not applicable. But we're dealing with Boolean algebra where this rule does apply. Any questions about this particular step? Okay, so I'm just gonna say distribution. It's always good to simplify things whenever you can. This one I cannot simplify. This one I cannot simplify. This one I can simplify, okay, because you know, the negation of B or B has to be true. And since you know, that true is inside the conjunction, I can simplify that true out of the way. And then we have not B or not C. And then we have the rest of the expression like so. So this is also just distribution. Oh, it's not distribution, I take it back. This is simplification. Pro, because I did two steps in one. Are we still doing okay so far? I have one mini CNF right now. This is my mini CNF. So whenever you have a mini CNF and the rest are disjunctions with individual variables, it makes it easy because you just distribute again. So this time, we are going to, okay, I'm copying and pasting just so that you can see the steps here. So this time, I'm just looking at this bunch of stuff, okay, from here all the way to here. So what I'm doing is I'm looking at this as A, B, C, or A. So I can distribute the or A into the, the individual components. I shouldn't say A, B, C because a is a symbol be, being used here. So if this is P, Q, R, okay, or A, then we have A or P and A or Q and A or P, Q, R, okay. So I'm using that distribution. Oops, sorry about that. All right. So now I can say, okay, let's do the distribution. <clears throat> so we have not A or B or A, not A or not C or A, not B or not C or A, and then we have a final or C out here. And this one is also the result of using distribution. Any questions about this step? Okay, so you look at this and go like, oh, Okay, so now we have a slightly bigger inflated um, CNF, and then we have an or something outside of the CNF. So we, we can blindly apply the same thing, okay? Let me just kind of blindly apply the entire thing, and then we look at the end result and go like, what is that, okay? So we'll go ahead and just blindly do the whole thing. So we have not A or B or A or C, not A or not C or A, or C, and then finally we have not B, or not C, or A, or C. And this is basically the last step of the distribution, because the idea, the concept behind this entire demonstration is not to show the original expression, it's always true, but to show you how to turn it into a CNF. This is how we turn the whole thing into a CNF. Is it messier than it needs to be? Yes, that was intentional. <laughs> but can we still prove the original expression is just true? The answer is yes, we can totally do that. Why? Because I can look at this one and go like, hmm, not A is here, A is here, this is one gigantic you know, disjunction, that turns into a one. Okay, technically it is a one or B or C. Okay, so we can do it one step at a time, that's fine. Okay, we look at the second one, it is a one, one, one or one because this not A versus this A, that's a one, 
this not C versus this C is another one. So it's one or one, or true or true. And then we look at the last one, we have not C, C in it. So those two become a, become a one, but we have the leftover of not A or B. But, but then we have this one over here because of not C, C are both in the same disjunction. Are we doing okay so far? Okay. So I am just, you know, this is, a, I just look at this as simplification. I'm pretty sure it has a very specific name. I think that name can be annihilation or something like that. When you have something and the negation of that something and they're in the same disjunction, then they quote unquote cancel out each other and becomes true. I'm not sure. I'm sure ChatGPT knows the name of that too. Let's, let's see whether it knows the name because I just want to test it and I want to know. Okay, so what is the name of the Boolean algebra rule where A or not A is true? Okay, let's see whether it understands this or not. It's the law of excluded middle. There we go. Now, if you're not sure about this, then you can go back and reverse the question and say, explain the law of excluded middle in Boolean algebra. It is always good to give it more context than you normally think it needs, okay? So in other words, instead of just saying, explaining the law of excluded uh, middle, you give it more context, okay? We want to know the meaning of the law of excluded middle specifically in Boolean algebra because you know, that's how um, GPTs you know, usually work is they need certain words to establish the context. So if you don't give it enough context, sometimes it may give you the wrong answer because it doesn't know, okay, should I pull the meaning of this thing from which context, depending on how common that particular phrase is. Now, in this case, I don't think it's going to be an issue because excluded middle, you know, seems uh, pretty specific, okay? You know, I don't know of any other term like that, but there we go. Yep, okay. So we have confirmation that it really is, that's the proper name of what I just called, you know, simplification. All right, I think that is pretty cool just to, you know, talk about this. All right, so getting back to our algebra here. So now we can simplify this to one and one. Okay, one and one and one. So I just called this simplification too. I'm sure it has a specific name. If you want the specific name, go back to chat GPT and ask for it. Okay, so you can say, what is the name of the rule that says uh, true or A is, okay, I really should use the more better term here, true or X is true. There we go. Known as the identity law or dominance law. There we go. If I were to take this class from a classic you know, professor teaching classic logic, I would probably get a C or B out of it just because I cannot remember names like these. It's like, why do I have to remember these names if I know what it is? <clears throat> All right, and then the last, so that's the simplification that we use in order to get from the second to the last line to the last line of the derivation. So from here, it is just true because true and True and true is just true. And that is because, okay, let's go find that name, the name of that rule. <laughs> what is the rule in Boolean algebra that says uh, X and true is X? Because that's basically the rule that I used from the second to the last line to the last line. And what is it doing? Why is it giving me two responses? 
and they are almost the same except for the last paragraph. It's known as the identity law again, and also the dominance law for conjunction. So there's one for for one for um, conjunction and one for disjunction. All right. So any questions about this? Nope. Okay. So let me go back to the example here. I have demonstrated two things. One is this expression with regardless of A, B, or C is guaranteed to be true. So that means this implication is always true, which also means if this side is true, then this side has to be true. That's why we use it as the only transformation or the only inference after we make modifications to the propositional logic system. The second thing I also demonstrated is I turned this entire thing into a unnecessarily complicated CNF before I simplified everything to true. So that was the original intent, was to show you, you can give me any Boolean expression, I can turn it into a CNF. Are we doing okay so far? Now, if you want a list of the laws of you know, Boolean algebra, you know, I used to search for that, but now that we have you know, chat GPT, <laughs> we can just ask chat GPT about that, okay? So give me a list of all the rules in Boolean algebra. There we go. It's a long list. <clears throat> you can also see how ChatGPT Chat uses LaTeX for the representation, you know, underneath, you know, underlying the, the math notations. Yep, so there are 12 altogether. They're not difficult, okay? You know, many of these are, they, they just make sense, okay? Like the last two, x is a variable, and true is just the variable itself. Second to the last one, x or false is always just x. So some of these really don't need a whole lot of memorization because, quote unquote, they just make sense. Um, the Morgan's Law we talked about already, uh, absorption is eh, absorption is a funky one um, because it says here x or x and y is just x. You can simplify. So in other words, if you have a disjunction, whatever term is quote unquote more restrictive is the one that you need to keep. The more general term can go away. Okay, which kind of makes sense in a way. But if you want to say, okay, I'm not a hundred percent convinced that this is this makes sense. What are you going to do? You look at one of these identities, you go like, I am not sure about the equality. What are you going to do? Hmm? Truth table. Very good. So you basically, if you're not convinced that, you know, I'm convinced that this equality holds, make a truth table with two independent variables, X and Y, and then work this out. Because you know, that will convince you that, oh, okay, this whole thing just simplifies to x. And the same thing for this one, when you have a conjunction, then you can keep the uh, most general term also. Oh, I take it back, I misspoke earlier. When you have a disjunction, you can throw away the more restrictive term. When you have a conjunction, you throw away the more general term. All right, so that one is kind of a little a little special. Uh, we talked about distribution already. Associative is not new to you. It simply means the ordering of operation does not matter. You have been using it all your life when you're dealing with multiplication and addition. So this is nothing new. Um, commutative, nothing new to you either because you know, addition and multiplication are both commutative. Uh, double negation, you already know this one because of you know, just colloquial use of negation, right? Um, complement, you know, we talked about this already, you know, how you know, in a disjunction, you know, x not x will quote unquote cancel out and become true. And then for disjunction, uh, excuse me, for disjunction, it becomes a one, for conjunction, it becomes a zero. Um, and then we have, I don't even know how to pronounce this term. 
idempotent. Okay, let's not butcher language and ask Google. Idempotent. 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 And the really cool thing, I'm not sure how many of you know about this, is that ESL person, I find this to be a great resource because you know I can click learn to pronounce and have it record my pronunciation. Okay, show. And it would actually show you the, the movement of the mouth. Idempotent. Idempotent. Um, I cannot remember where I can find the interface, but there's an interface somewhere where I can, I think it may, may be feedback, where I can speak to it using the mic. It would analyze the way I enunciate the word and correct the way I pronounce the word. So I think it is feedback. I can be wrong here. Uh, nope, that's not it. Mm, I cannot remember, but it's a really cool example. It's yet another way we use AI these days. Okay, it's really kind of cool. Um, right. So ChatGPT. So you will have a homework assignment that talks about you know how to um, convert a general expression into a CNF. This is the quick and easy way to find all the applicable Boolean algebra rules. As I said, there are 12 bunch of them, but many of these just kind of make sense, okay? The ones that are kind of tricky is the absorption. Uh, distribution is a little bit tricky because it has the extra distribution rule. Uh, the Morgan's law is unique to Boolean algebra. So there are only a few of these that are kind of like, eh, okay, those are, Kind of little extra, but the the rest are fairly uh, simple. I mean, I would say they're fairly easy to remember and understand. Yep. Commutative means you can exchange the order. Associative means you can change the ordering between the operators. Um, okay, so let me illustrate. So if, you're, if something is associative, it means A plus B, the whole thing plus C, is the same thing as A plus and then B plus C. This is associative. And then uh, commutative means you can change the order. So A plus B is B plus A. That is commutative. There we go. Yeah, we, we use these rules all the time, and we just usually do not refer to the names. Um, so that's why these two, you know, should not be a big issue because, you know, that's common in the normal algebra that we already use. All right. Excellent. Any other questions about CNFs? Do we know what a CNF is? Okay, so let me give you some examples and let and you tell me whether it is a in CNF already. So CNF stands for conjunctive normal form. And the most intuitive way to describe it is a CNF is a conjunction of disjunctions where each disjunction can only contain variables constants or negation of variables. Okay, so that's the best way I can describe it in words. So I'm gonna ask you, so let's say, let's say we have variables P, Q, R, and constants zero and one. Okay, is that okay? So you know these things have to be in alpha, right? Because alpha is the set that contains all the symbols that we want to use. So now we want to evaluate. Uh, is how about this one? Does that look like a CNF to you? Just P all by itself. That doesn't that doesn't sound right. Okay, variable P by itself. Is it in CNF? It does not look like a CNF. The question is, can I make it look like a CNF? Okay, so 
Uh, okay, so first of all, we need uh, disjunctions, right? P is not a disjunction, fine. Is that okay as a, as a disjunction? Okay, and you look like this and go like, hmm, but it's not a conjunction. Now it's a conjunction without changing the value. So that's why, you know, when we encounter a single variable or the negation thereof, it is already in CNF. Because we can turn it into a CNF by using, you know, some of the constants and some of the earlier, the rules that we talked about earlier. Okay. What about P or Q? Does that look like a CNF to you? You look like, no, this is a disjunction. It's supposed to be a conjunction. That's okay. I can easily convert it into a conjunction of disjunctions. P or Q is a disjunction and true. Now it is a conjunction and one of the components is a disjunction. If, and if anyone complains about one by itself is not a disjunction, that's all we need to do. Now we have a conjunction of disjunctions in both cases. Are we good so far? So normally we don't do it like this, okay? Simply because it's just taking up space and you have to type a lot more than what you need. We just basically recognize a variable by itself. It's in CNF already. If you have a single disjunction where each component of the disjunction is a variable or the negation thereof, it is already a CNF. Is that okay? All right. So now we look at um, the negation of P or Q. Is that a CNF? Does it meet all the requirements that we talk about here? It is a conjunction of disjunctions. Well, this is the negation of a disjunction. So it is not in CNF. Okay, so we have to say this is not in CNF. It is not in conjunctive normal form. Can, how do we convert this into a CNF? What is the quickest and easiest way to turn it into a CNF? De Morgan's Law, very good. Okay, so we can turn it into a CNF by just you know, saying it is not P and not Q. That is in CNF, but it is equivalent. So when you read something like this, you have to remember Negation applies to the thing that is immediately to its right-hand side. So in this case, not P is by itself one thing, and then not Q is one thing by itself, because negation applies immediately to whatever is on its right-hand side. It has the highest priority of all operators. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> so I'm going to emphasize this, you know, just so that people understand what I just said or visually remember that. So if I were to use unnecessary parentheses, it would have been like this. Okay, um, let's see, what else? What are other examples I can give you guys? Um, the negation of P, Q, okay? Is that in CNF? The entire thing. Is it a conjunction of disjunctions? Well, it has a conjunction of things, but the overall operator, the last operator, is not a conjunction. The last operator is a negation. It is not in CNF, okay? So I will say this is not in CNF. How do I convert it into CNF? Well, we apply De Morgan's Law. Not P or not Q is now in CNF. Not P or not Q is a disjunction, but it is a disjunction that only contains either variables or the negations of variables. But it's not in a conjunction. Well, we we can fix that not in a conjunction problem by ending it with one or zero. Then it is in a CNF. So typically we don't have to go that far. We just say that you know, this is already in CNF. So are we doing okay so far? Okay, let's have one more example. Uh, let's say, you know, P implies Q. 
P implies Q is definitely not in CNF because there's no conjunction in P implies Q. The operator is implication, it is not a conjunction. So the way we turn it into a CNF is to say, oh, okay, by definition, this is the same thing as not P or Q. Now that is in CNF because it is just a disjunction of either variables or the negations of variables. So even though the disjunction is by itself, we can always use the same trick over here so that it is part of a conjunction of disjunctions. <clears throat> Are we doing okay so far here? Okay, so I'm gonna take some requests here. Okay, does anyone want to give me a particular expression to turn into CNF? There's one example already in the module. Let's not work with that one. I want to work with something new. So you can give me something that is, you know, you just come up with. Okay, so this is something that you can think about, okay? If you are going to do some exercise, okay, and go like, okay, I want to give myself some expressions to work with just so that I know, you know, the process of doing this, any expression into your CNF conversion, how would you go about doing that? How would you construct a random Boolean expression? Yes. Okay, let's do that. <laughs> I'm not sure. You can actually parameterize your construction of the uh, random Boolean expression. Give me a random Boolean expression. Okay, so let's see how. Okay, that looks. Okay, let's try this one. Okay, so we'll try. A and B and then or, okay, so this is A or A and B, A, B, or not C and D or E. Okay, so are we doing okay so far with this conversion between the formats? Um, this is the full mathematical notation of A and B. This is the way that I write A and B, you know, like multiplication. Whatever, whatever is an or here appears as a plus over here. Negation is exclamation point. Once again, conjunction looks like multiplication. Disjunction looks like an addition. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> so let's work with this one together, and then you guys can work with me. How to do this? Um, okay. So we can work it from the inside out, okay? So we'll keep AB the way it is, and then work with this side. So we'll go ahead and say, this is already a mini CNF. This entire thing is a mini CNF, and this is another CNF, and we have an OR between the two CNFs. All right, so what are we going to do? Hmm? We cannot use De Morgan's law because there's no negation of an operator. This negation is applicable to just variable C. It is not to the conjunction of C and the rest. Okay. Um, so, yeah, distribution is the only way we can do this. Okay. So, if we use distribution, what are we going to do with that distribution? So we can use, uh, we can look at this as, okay, so let's go back and look at distribution again. This is distribution. Both of these are distributions. Which one do you think I want to use? The first one or the second one? The first one. Well, okay, so I think when people say the first one, they want to apply the first one to this part here. Well, we can always you know, try it out. If it doesn't work, we just go like, eh, it's a scenic route, you know, it's okay. Take a few pictures and move on. All right, so it, there's nothing wrong with giving it a try. So that's what happens when we apply that particular distribution. So now we have A, B, or not C and D, or not C and E. There we go. Okay, that is a DNF. This is a disjunctive normal form. 
So when we have a disjunctive normal form, what are we going to do? We, we can no longer apply one particular distribution, right? So what do we do? Apply the other, okay? So this means you know, we're going to have to apply the other distribution, which is this one here, okay? Because we have a bunch of ors, and you know, each component of the or is a conjunction. All right, so you guys remember FOIL, right? You know, we applied FOIL earlier. Let's apply FOIL to just these two, okay? <clears throat> so we're going to do a FOIL on these two using you know, the second distribution law. So now we're going to look, look at this and go like, all right, so that will turn this into four terms, right? I mean, that's why, you know, that's what FOIL does is, you know, it's two by two into four. So we have A or not C, A or D, B or not C, B or D. And then we have the or with, you know, the other term. Is that working out okay with you? Okay. And then what are we going to do? This is completely mechanical. Do it, do it again, right? Yep. So this time when we FOIL, well, it's not technically FOIL, but it is kind of FOIL, we end up with eight terms, okay? So this time I'm going to cheat a little bit by copying and pasting, because you know, if I don't do that, it's going to be eh, a little bit tedious. So basically, with the first four, we just say, oh, let's go ahead and or the not C, which is from the, the not C is coming from here, okay? So I know we can do a bunch of simplifications, but I'm not going to do it just so that we can see what the result looks like. And then for the other four, we're going to or that with the second term of the other one. So we basically just say this is or E, okay. Copy, paste, paste, and paste. Okay, so technically speaking, now we have a CNF. We can stop if if the question is asking you to turn the original expression into a CNF. We can stop now. It is a CNF. But many of you look at this and go like, "Ew." We can simplify certain things out of this so that at least it looks nicer. Yes, you can. So let's look at the you know, simplification and see how far we can simplify this. Okay, so with simplification, I am going to copy and paste again, just so that you know I can. Okay, let me turn off that notification. There we go. Because um, people from both classes that I'm teaching, three ten and four forty, have set up their uh, Discord servers, and I'm subscribing, and Discord is running. I can always just you know, kind of not run Discord right now. Quit Discord. There we go. All right, so now we have no distraction. Okay, this we can simplify like that. And the same way here, right there. Um, okay, so that's the first you know, wave of uh, simplification. Okay. Next, we can do more simplifications. Why do you think I can do more simplifications? I'll give you a clue. Absorption, okay? So where can we apply absorption in this case? And what does it mean in absorption? Okay, let me remind you. In a conjunction, we can get rid of the more general term. In a disjunction, we can get rid of the more specific term. Okay, so we have a one gigantic conjunction, right? So now we have to think about what do we mean by the more general term and the more specific term? A or not C versus A or D or not C. Okay, first of all, can I refer to these two as one being the more general version of the other one? I think so, because A or D or not C uh, is the more general version of A or not C. If A or not C is true, then A or D or not C has to be true too. Not quite the other way around, okay? 
But I can say that if A or not C is true, I don't care why it is true, then we guarantee that A or D or not C also has to be true. Which means we can get rid of the more general one because it is implied by the more specific one. So to be more clear, this is the more specific term compared to this term over here. In a conjunction, we can get rid of the more general term, so this one can go bye-bye. Okay, then we can do the same thing here, B or not C. So, you know, the D, eh, it's not gonna do anything useful here. We can get rid of this one. And then we move on to the second row. Okay, this one, we can also get rid of this one because it is the more general term of A or not C. So we can toss that. This one we cannot get rid of, okay, because I don't have anything yet that has all of these three variables together. So I cannot get rid of this one. Uh, this one I can get rid of because this one is the more general one of B or not C. So we can get rid of this one. So now we have a simplified version of the original expression. And then I cannot perform any further simplification at this point. In order for this entire thing to stay as a CNF, as a conjunctive normal form, this is as far as I can push it in terms of simplification. All right. So the question is, the next question is, are we really sure that this means exactly the same thing as what we have originally, like this expression? Does it really mean the same thing as this expression here? The answer is, oh, I can certainly have made a mistake and not know about it. So the question is, how do you cross-check it? Truth table, and do you want to work out the truth table by hand? Probably not. <laughs> so the question is, what do you do <clears throat> in cases like this? It's like, ugh, I know I can do this, but I don't want to have to do it. So what do you do? You can use a spreadsheet, you know, which is a general way to do it, but you don't have to use a spreadsheet because somebody can complain and say, Tech, uh, there's no prerequisite that we have to take a spreadsheet class before this class. You cannot require me to use a spreadsheet. Fine, use C++. So we'll go ahead and use C++ in this case, okay? There are many ways to do the same thing. The question is, are you going to be the person being resourceful and go like, hey, if I cannot do it this way, I can do it the other way. Or are you gonna be the person that goes like, well, I don't know what to do now. I'm just gonna sit and wait. Okay, so let's do this the other way. So we'll go ahead and make a program called verify.c. This is just plain C, by the way. You know, there's nothing fancy here. And I will do the bad programming practice of not even using functions or any type of abstraction here. And I'm going to say int a, b, c, d, what, e, right? There are two, five variables. Then I say for a equals to zero, a is uh, less than or equal to one plus plus a. Actually, I take this back because I'm, I don't want to have to type all this stuff you know, all over the place. So I'm just gonna pound define a macro. <laughs> uh, we'll call it explore. No, that's, that's too long. EXP, okay, EXP uh, variable name B. And that just, is, that just becomes for B equals zero. B is less than or equal to one plus plus B. Okay, so use a macro. There are places where macros are actually helpful, like this. Explore A, explore B, explore C. Okay, I'm even getting a little bit tired of having to type all that, copy and paste, right? All right, so now we have a five level deep loop here because we have five for loops. Uh, I don't have any curly braces you know, until at this point. So it all depends on whether I have anything to do that requires the, the braces. In other words, am I gonna, have, am I gonna need um, multiple statements or not? Okay, and I'm gonna say no, okay? So let's go ahead and see what we can do with a single statement and be able to do everything that we need to do, which is evaluate 
the first form of the expression, evaluate the last form of the expression, and to check whether they are the same or not. Okay, so this is how I might go about doing this. So A and B, so this time I have to actually do the whole thing. Uh, we have not C and D or E. Okay, okay, that's one expression. Okay. Um, we'll say equal, equal. Now this is a, a, a risky move, okay? So I would rather not to do the equal, equal right here. I'm gonna turn it into zero and one first. So if this is not zero, then we say it's a one, otherwise we turn it into a zero. Because what is true in C and C++, and what is false in C and C++? Zero is the same as false, but anything other than zero is true, right? So that means you know, if the Boolean expression is true, the actual quote unquote integer value that I can use for comparison can be six, can be negative 25, can be 1,000, can be negative 20, 200,000, because the range of integer is at least 32 bit, which means I have four billion values that are all representing true. And I have no idea which one it's gonna use. Now, you guys will say, but that's stupid. You know, you know it's, as a compiler, GCC is gonna give you one particular value to represent true. Yes, in terms of implementation, that is what the, length, the, the compiler does, but there's no guarantee. If the compiler, you know, if the person who's writing GCC decides, you know, I know people make this kind of mistakes all day long, so I'm going to make the compiler to generate code to return a non-zero random number every time we have an expression that is true, it is not wrong. <laughs> In fact, it's a good thing to do to make sure that people don't make mistakes like this, okay? So I'm going to turn it into a zero and a one explicitly just so that we can compare, right? So now we compare this to the value of the other expression, and the other expression has A or oh, not C, and <laughs> this is gonna take a while to type, B or not C, and A or D or E, Ugh. okay, and what? B or D or E, there we go. All right, so I want to convert this into a ternary expression as well, so I can compare just one versus zero. Okay, so question mark, one colon zero, there we go. Okay, so now I guarantee, I'm guaranteed to be comparing one versus one, zero versus zero. In other words, Instead of just any non-zero integer, I'm guaranteeing that true is just one. I'm also guaranteeing that false is just zero. That's the easy one. The true is the more difficult one. So now I can say if it is the same, then we print f matches. Otherwise, we print f not a match. Okay, there we go. Semicolon. Done. All right, so let's let's check it out. Um, GCC dash G dash O verify dot C. Oh, I need to specify the executable name, which I am just going to call verify here. Oh, compile the first time. That's not common even for me. Okay, so we'll go ahead and run it. Okay, I forgot the line feed, so it's a little bit hard to read. So let me fix the line feed here. And we are really just looking for not a match, so I really technically don't have to print matches, because if everything works, I don't need to... Oh, I need to compile first. Sorry about that. Okay, there we go. So it matches. The question is, do we have the right number of matches? There's a program called WC. You know, for those of you who come from Europe, don't laugh. It does not mean water closet, which means your bathroom in 
America. WC stands for word count. So it would count the number of words, the number of lines, and I think the number of characters. I cannot remember. It gives you a bunch of lines. Okay, 32 lines. Does that sound right up to you? Do we have 32 rows in this particular truth table? We have five independent variables. Two to the power of five is 32. So having 32 lines of output is correct. Okay. Then you guys may say, but tech, maybe you just, you know, kind of, I know you guys want to leave now, but let's just say that I make a mistake somewhere. Okay, so let's go ahead and make a mistake and say, ah, I'm just, you know, negating B when it's not supposed to be negating. So this way it would not have some matches. So let's run this again to make sure that the program does, you know, verify that we have, you know, things that are not matching. So now it shows you the entries that are not matching. It doesn't quite show you which one are not matching. You can kind of fix the program to do that. You know, the printf can be extended to show the actual values of A, B, C, D, E if you want to. But that's a, I would say, qu pretty quick and easy way to check whether two Boolean expressions are truly the same or not. All right, I'll see you guys on Wednesday. I don't have any homework assignment for you right now, but I think practicing conversion to CNF is going to be helpful, and you already know that ChatGPT can give you random Boolean expressions, and you have a tool to double check whether two Boolean expressions are the same or not. So you have tools already to give yourself you know, exercises before Wednesday. So I'll see all of you on Wednesday, and uh, oh, double check your um, exam one stuff too. Make sure that your folder does have your exam and the key in it. If not, you know, let me know, and I'll probably fix the script. Probably is a little scripting issue. Cool.